Hi, I'm Jalamoth, the curator of all things curious, and welcome to the Jala Review, an ongoing series where I rank every movie ever made. I haven't really reviewed many quite yet. I have discussed like 20 or so horror movies during Jalloween and every Ryan Gosling movie for some reason last year. And I let the Jalla man rant about The Breakfast Club that one time, but there's a reason that's our least viewed thing on this channel, and it's not the copyright claim it got. Dude was way too easy on it. But you could also kind of say the same thing about my one review currently up on this channel, my discussion of Edgar Wright's Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. The movie isn't without its faults, problems that I really didn't explain anywhere near as well as my praises for it. But my leniency with reviews ends today. Even though I don't have long to make this, this video cannot be only praises. Mark my words, I will find something wrong with Baby Driver or my name is Antel Elgort. And thank goodness it's not! What an insane name, by the way. He had to have been named by German gnomes or something. Speaking of our lead actor, though, before we dive into Baby Driver fully, I think it'd probably be smart to say a quick word about the whole situation regarding Ansel Elgort. But firstly, we should briefly talk about these Jamie Foxx allegations. And there's no chance in hell we're gonna ignore what Kevin Spacey did. I like John Hamm so much that I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do any Googling about him. I'm just gonna hope for the best. Because I rank every movie I discuss against one another, there's been one big question looming over my head all week. Is Baby Driver better than Scott Pilgrim? To answer that question, I'm gonna first need to issue a spoiler warning for the entirety of this movie and a bit of this one too. If you've never seen it, Baby Driver is a crime movie about music. It's very fast, exciting, satisfying, it's a tight-knit movie that has everything you'd expect from an Edgar Wright film. And when I said this movie was about music, I really meant it. I'll get more into that near the end, but this almost feels like a two-hour music video at times. The soundtrack ends up being very visual, but only because the set designers sneak the lyrics into the songs everywhere, and because of how Baby interacts with the world around him in relation to that OST. If it's not clear already, Wright is a very detail-oriented man, which is a great trait for a director to have. Every single step the characters take looks like it was painstakingly choreographed, but it pays off, and then some. It almost gives this movie the feel of animation, but with nothing but a camera and some dedication. It's, it's magical. This movie feels so much like a movie, but never really feels unreal because of how human the characters are. And just like Scott Pilgrim, this movie only exists because a creative person heard a great song and let their imagination just take them. Is that not unfathomably based? I'm gonna take a page out of Edgar Wright, Brian Lee O'Malley, and Araki's book because I think there's no better creative influence than music. But before I go on some massive rant about the sound design, let's get the story in order, especially for those who haven't seen it and bypassed my spoiler warning. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Our story begins with a thrilling heist, and we see it all unfold from the perspective of the job's getaway driver, a young man with the moniker of Baby. He's the classic criminal with a heart of gold. And honestly, this might be one of my favorite portrayals of a character that falls within that trope. He lost both his parents very early on in his life in a head-on collision that he saw the entirety of. On top of losing his parents, this left him with a permanent ringing in his ears, a condition called tinnitus. He spent all of his next formative years in Atlanta, making himself useful by boosting cars. Except one day he chose the wrong Mercedes to steal, one with hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise in the trunk, a car belonging to a crime pin known only as Doc. So since that day, Baby has spent over a decade, a majority of his life, indebted to that man. He's been Doc's getaway driver ever since, a job he wants nothing more to do with than to escape. But since he really can't, he turns to music and stashes what money he does get to keep under the floorboards of his foster dad's house. This is Baby's foster dad, an elderly deaf man named Joe. We never learn how the two met, but their bond is so real that you never even question it. That's just his foster dad. The scenes we get with these two really put on display how much heart and kindness this criminal really has. And even when he is actively participating in crime, he's doing just about as little as possible without getting himself killed. Then there's this arc where he becomes the best goddamn pizza driver in all of Atlanta. Oh, okay, well, this isn't a race. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The opening to this movie is phenomenal. It shows exactly why Baby is such a devil behind the wheel. Maybe I haven't seen enough action movies, but this is my favorite police chase I've ever seen. It's so creative, and it keeps baiting you to make a point about just how daring and skilled Baby really is. Like when John Bernthal tells him to get going and he reverses, or the helicopter trick, or the car switching maneuver. The whole scene is just this phenomenal introduction to the world of the getaway. But it doesn't just show he's skilled, it shows he's human. He's goofing off and jamming out the whole time he's waiting. When he hears cops throw on their sirens, he gets really panicked only to realize that they were responding to a different situation. Every little character moment in this movie is just perfect, and there's dozens of them. But Edgar Wright, being who he is, wasn't happy with just one of the best openings of the last 10 years of cinema. But he just decided to do it again, in the same movie. Right after the chase and title card, we get into, honestly, an equally well-made intro to the movie, a scene of Baby going to pick up some coffee down the street for the crew. 
true. You might be thinking, how could him going to grab some coffee rival that intense first scene? Well, if you've seen some of this guy's other work, like Shaun of the Dead, then you'll know that just walking around town can be some of the most important shots that a movie has to offer. In this coffee scene, Baby is comfortable despite his current circumstances. It's like he's living in a movie. Everything is bright, his themes are playing in his headphones, it's a picturesque stroll through the city. The words in his music can be found all throughout the scene on signs and graffiti. It makes it feel like a comic book or something. It's campy and light and whimsical. But then, outside the coffee shop, he sees a beautiful woman, a woman we'll later know as Deborah. After Baby sees her, it's like he was ripped straight out of this fantasy that he's been living. He's been trying to tell himself that the life he's leading is fine, but one look at Debbie and everything subtly changes. He's no longer smooth and cool, he's too distracted to grab his own coffee. We see him walk all the way back to the building, but this time it's different. Instead of hearing nice, bustling sounds of the city, we hear cars honking, jackhammers, pedestrians arguing, the whole sound profile becomes harsh. Instead of crossing where he did before, he jaywalks. He has to avert his eyes from a cop to avoid suspicion. A doomsday Christian yells at him with a megaphone right in his ringing ears. The graffiti is no longer aligned with the soundtrack, and so it feels less magical and more sketchy. But almost like a light at the end of a dark tunnel, there's a trumpeter soloing near the entrance of where Baby was heading. His solo is, of course, perfectly layered over the soundtrack. It all feels very animated and human. I said that before, and I'll likely continue to say it, because there's really no better way to put it. It's got the charm of a classic Disney movie at times, Wright's style is just that punchy and dynamic. We see Baby go get coffee once again later in the movie after a few important layers have been added to his character, and on the way back he looks into the mirrored reflection of a skyscraper as if to just for a second ask himself, am I really doing this again? But there's obviously no point in asking because does he really have a choice? I've kind of only seen Ansel Elgort in this, and Divergent and The Fault in Our Stars, but those were both like over a decade ago now. I have no clue what you'd typecast this dude as, but this is a perfect role for him. Someone charismatic and well-meaning, yet very reserved. But despite not talking much, I think Baby's a pretty interesting character. Instead of watching the news about his crimes or reading about them in the newspaper anxiously, he's more interested in the girl at the diner. If Baby chose to be here doing this, the level of disconnection between his attitude and what he's doing would be reprehensible. But because he's got virtually no choice in the matter other than do or die, it comes off as oddly charming when he's trying to goof off or distract himself while people are getting hurt and robbed. I'm not even sure if this guy owns a smartphone, just the burners he gets from work and a few dozen iPods. This really accentuates how stuck in the past he is. I mean, just look at his daydreams. It's clear he has this old school, traditional view of what happiness looks like. One that he's never known because of his troubled upbringing. He's always found it better to just listen instead of speaking for himself, and we see this all over the movie. When asked if he was listening to the plan at all from another heist crew member, Bats, he recites the entire plan word for word even though he was blasting jazz the entire time. He takes Debbie to a fancy restaurant, but he only knows about that place to begin with because he heard Buddy say it before the first job when he's bragging about taking his darling out. He even uses Buddy's line about it being the finest wine and dine of all the wines and dines in town. Something I find pretty interesting is just how adverse Baby is to lying. He may tiptoe around a situation, but it clearly makes him uncomfortable to be straight up dishonest. Early in the movie, he's flipping through channels on the TV after Joe crashed. And of course there's foreshadowing in the TV commercials, did you forget who directed this? But Baby catches a brief scene from Monsters Inc. of Mike and Sully reconciling. Then later, he uses the line from Mike Wazowski that he heard that night on Doc. Even to someone like him, Baby would rather repeat a movie quote than use his own words to lie. Unfortunately, Doc had recently seen Monsters, Inc., so that didn't really turn out all too well. Don't feed me any more lines from Monsters, Inc. It pisses me off. It's one of Sam's favorites. But every time Baby finally works up the nerve and the backbone to stand up for himself, the words he uses are never his own. He just parrots words back that he's already heard. This is because Baby has had a weird, antisocial life and he has no better way to relate to other people. Or at least he can't find the words within himself to do that, so he uses others. Like when he tells Bats that he in fact doesn't squeal on the cops, but squeals on the road. Which was an allegation he was, at this point, yet to be. You know, with him being found recording their conversations and stuff. Honestly, with how meta Edgar Wright can be and how much quoting Baby does, I'm surprised there's no drive reference anywhere in this movie. Especially since he's literally him. He stays out in the car, he doesn't carry a gun, he drives. Even the you don't belong in this world that he tells Debbie is the exact same words he once heard from Joe. Even though all of this is so subtle, it's kind of what makes this a great portrayal of the hesitant criminal with a heart of gold to me. Whenever he's got to steal someone's car or face deathly consequences, he always apologizes and gives the people their items before he speeds off, like their purse or their baby. Death of any kind is incredibly off-putting to Baby, likely because of his repressed trauma. One of the most personal things in this film is this moment when Baby meets this teller at the bank that they're about to hit later this week. 
She's really kind. She gives Doc's autistic nephew, who's there for some reason, a mint. She talks about Dolly Parton. This scene goes on and on. Then you understand why when Baby asks her schedule. It crushes Baby inside to know that the place that he's gonna roll over has human beings in it, ones who may not survive his crewmate's wrath and greed. When they're hitting an armored truck, he drives forward 20 feet so he doesn't even have to see what's happening. He frequently has to make purposeful mistakes so that his trigger-happy crewmates don't end up taking lives that they didn't need to. Plenty of people lose their lives in this movie, but Baby's only directly responsible for two of those, which were entirely self-defense. We'll talk more on those later, but that subtle underbelly of kindness is what elevates this from a regular crime flick to something kind of different. Now let's talk about Deborah. Debbie is a really enjoyable character. She's got a cute country accent and she answers the phone with to what do I owe this honor? Her problem isn't being unlikable, that's for sure. But her entire characterization is mostly done in the first two scenes that she's prominently in. She's really charming. Her dialogue with Baby is iconic and wonderful, like them talking about how many songs have their name in them. It does really help that both of these actors are incredibly effortlessly charismatic. Whether it's sharing headphones at the laundromat, or making the glasses resonate with their fingers at dinner, what we see of the two is great. I guess I just wanted a little more? Although I will say I am pleased with the runtime of this movie. I like short but sweet, and at right under two hours, this is pretty brisk for how much it covers. But I just don't exactly know how to describe my feelings here. Her and Baby's relationship is really cute and feels pretty real at first, at least for a movie couple, but we just don't see enough of her to believe that she'd run away with this guy. I mean, it is her sole motivation to escape her life just like Baby, so it doesn't feel forced necessarily, just kind of wild. Their similar motives just aren't really enough to me, and it doesn't come across as as whimsical as it was likely meant to. Maybe I've just seen this too many times, but even on my first watch, these two's relationship was never really the standout aspect of the movie, even though I think it had the potential to be. A problem with many of Edgar Wright's female characters is that they can sometimes feel more like a device than a person, just a thing to move the story along and get the main character to change who they are. And Debbie really doesn't escape that. She really only exists to coax Baby into finally running from this life, a decision he really wouldn't have made on his own. But with that choice, he drags her with, basically signing her up to die. It feels crazy. I like the whole lovers eloping trope, but it's a little hard to tell whether she fills her role or she's nothing but that role. I don't know. What does my 7% think about this? Not gonna lie, every time I do a review of an Edgar Wright movie, I feel like I need a woman on standby. I just feel like she's oddly trusting of a guy that she's met like a total of three times, one of which was for five minutes and the other two were for like a few hours max. They've been on one date, she just learned his name, and she's ready to throw everything away for him. I understand she doesn't have much in this city, but that doesn't mean you leave everything, take none of your belongings, and go on the run with a dangerous criminal. Because seriously, she has nothing. She doesn't want to bring her clothes or any little thing could have destroyed this plan. Like, like what if she just had like a cat or dog she didn't want to leave? In real life, this situation could have easily started to go a lot more towards the drive direction and she would have been none the wiser. I will say, the tense scene of Baby calling and asking if she's down to leave about halfway through the movie does remedy this a bit and overall was pretty well done. But even after her shady ass encounter with the crew and him standing her up at 2am, she still trusts him wholeheartedly. Like I said, it's not that her trust is misplaced, but all I can think of is just, why? She watches Baby cap a dude and still decides to run with him and not towards the police. Granted, Baby did non-fatally wound Buddy because of his unstated no-red policy, but she doesn't know he's still alive. Then, she watches him jack a car and she doesn't bat an eye. The guy they steal from is like, Ayo, can I at least get my phone? And Baby's like, no, because he needs to listen to Ram Ranch on Ox or something. You're telling me after that she still thinks this is the nicest guy in the world? Then, when they do take off, she instantly realizes, oh, this guy's a criminal, not a chauffeur like I was led to believe. And while he didn't straight up lie to her, he did withhold a pretty crucial piece of info. And she still doesn't care. Actually, it's played for laughs. I know I got no help. Not a chauffeur. No. <laughs> Listen, you can form your own opinion on it, but at the end of the day, this aspect of the movie is what keeps it from greatness. A more realized love story could have taken this from an 8 to a 10. Let's save my review for when I put this thing up against its predecessor, but for now, something else this movie shares with Scott Pilgrim, other than its half-baked love interest, is a wonderful rogues gallery of villains. And at the very bottom of that totem pole is Bats. Bats is another one of Doc's hired criminals, like Baby, Buddy, Darling, and all the others. He can be a little annoying, but his personality is at least pretty interesting. This isn't really something I've ever paid attention to, except for this most recent watch. But before they do every job with Bats, he goes in this long mantra about how the people they're going to rob are guilty. No matter what he's stealing, he tells himself out loud, these people deserve it. They stole from us. We're just taking it back. It's this lie, this altered state he puts himself in, which allows him to be so disconnected from reality. 
It enables him to be as trigger happy and unhinged as he wants. Like the time when he forces the crew to stop at a gas station, asks Buddy if he wants some gum, and because he says yes, Bats steals all the gum and presumably did something awful to the clerk. He's more of a shoot first, ask questions last kind of guy. And while Jamie Foxx is a good actor, this portrayal just doesn't really hit for me. It's effective, but not much more than that. No real pizzazz. I mean, the guy only had so much to work with. Fox is the lead in my favorite movie ever made, but he was also bullied by Tarantino into being right for the role. Quentin Tarantino. So he was, again, a tyrant. You know, he was, he was at this, do not fuck my film up. But, but that's what you want. Do you? You? You, want, you, want a, you want a director who, even if you're going off the cliff, you know that you're going off the fucking cliff. But don't you want the freedom to also kind of add nah, your twist? Not no? with him. No. And he said, cut. Could I talk to you for a second? Close the door. Uh-oh. Uh, what the fuck is that? I said, what do you mean? I, I knew I was going to have this problem. Uh, you come in with your fucking Louis bag and your fucking Range Rover. He's a fucking slave. And then, and then, he becomes the hero. But lose that shit. Door swings open, he walks out. Wow. Would you work with Quentin Tar Tarantino again, or is it just too goddamn... A thousand times. Oh, you would. Speaking of Django, if you hear a lot of background noise in this video, it's my cat Django being a little silly. With a different director, I might be a little more interested in this character, but Edgar Wright isn't really like Tarantino, obviously. For instance, if Quentin Tarantino made Scott Pilgrim for some reason, he'd force Michael Cera to be Scott Pilgrim, but in Edgar Wright's version, he sort of changes who Scott Pilgrim is to be more like Michael Cera. He lets the lead actors have a lot of influence on their parts, and that kind of feels like what happened here a bit, but I obviously don't know that for sure, only Jamie Foxx and Edgar Wright would. And I do want to make it clear that while I don't find this character that captivating, he isn't really bad by any means. He's a world of threatening. It's clear Baby's terrifying to be anywhere near him. Something I like about Bats is that he's a little bit more intelligent than he leads on, or at least more observant, that's for sure. He was the one to notice Baby leaving in the middle of the night. He instantly picks up that Baby and Deborah know each other. He literally pulls a gun on her, and in all likelihood would have blown her away, all just to see how Baby would react. All that just to confirm a suspicion he had. Bats is explosive, quite literally at one point. Every scene that he's in is so intense and uncomfortable, from forcing Baby to go to the diner, to shooting first at the pickup, to his brutal end when he threatened Baby one too many times. But much like Debbie, Bats just kind of feels like a narrative device most of the time. A character just there to rile everything up and stir the pot and challenge Baby at every step. I like him in the movie, but he does feel a tad one note. I will say that he does have an intriguing connection to the musical theme of the film though. He talks in one scene of the importance, or rather unimportance, of music, and how he once had a past crewmate walk out on a job just because of a foreboding song playing on the radio. For better or worse, music is the thing that either binds or separates these characters, like Buddy, the next villain on our totem pole, who happens to bond with Baby over music. They talk about what songs pump them up and make them feel like the main character, which is interesting because I ask myself that same question all the time, and I'll almost certainly make a video about that topic rather soon. But Baby's answer is Brighton Rock by Queen, and he and Buddy have a moment together listening to it. Same as Bats, I think there's no real big X factor to Buddy's character, but like I said, I'm very partial to John Hamm. Plus, I'm a big fan of the trope where an unsuspected character becomes a villain. Not even like a twist villain, but someone who was once good or gray and because of something that happens in the plot is now directly opposing the lead. Like, sure, Buddy is a criminal known for being brutal and rash. It's not impossible for him to get to this point, obviously. But it's not exactly what we were expecting from what we know of him. He defended Baby quite a few times right from the start, from John Bernthal's character, from Bats, and he even respects Baby enough to tell him, you did good, kid. Next time the doc calls, don't pick up but it's his corruption and his rage that overtakes him. And while you may not be remembering John Hamm's buddy as one of your favorite villains down the road or anything, it's still a wonderful and unique feeling when a character you've known for the whole movie and are kind of attached to falls into that role. His interception of Baby trying to sneak away before the big money job is crazy. John Hamm doesn't get enough of these serious roles in my opinion. Or maybe I'm just saying that because I've only really seen him in Tag in that one Lonely Island music video with Rihanna. And also this guy. Speaking of shy Ronnie and Clyde, Buddy and Darling are this Bonnie and Clyde duo, this toxic view of Romeo and Juliet. The script even directly references this by having Buddy quote it when he's on the hunt. The reason he's after Baby is because he blames Darling's death on him entirely. He calls him a jinx, most likely because of how much Doc calls him his good luck charm. So he chases him down blaring his song, Bright and Rock. It's an awesome moment. Bats might have been crazy, but so is Buddy, and this movie makes that very clear. Buddy is just as perceptive. He picks up on Baby planning to leave instantly, just from the inflection of what he says. You can see it on his face. 
And while Bats was sort of the opposite of Baby, Buddy is this dark, sad view of what he could become if he stays in the world of crime. And Doc, well, if Seven and uh, real life haven't taught you yet, Kevin Spacey makes for a pretty realistic psychopath. I was just blinded by the balls on that kid. Whoa, whoa, all, all right, save it for the judge, pal. His stone cold face and deadpan delivery becomes genuinely threatening by the end of the movie, especially since he refuses to let Baby go even after they're even. Like I said, Baby's his good luck charm, which is why even as a child he's been his getaway driver for every single job. I honestly wish we would have gotten a scene that takes place in the in-between period of him being a child and him being here. We even hear about this big job they did together way back when. A 20 second scene of that would have been nice. I think it maybe would have stuck harder in the audience's head that he really has been trapped into this life by this man. He wants Baby docile, quiet, by himself, and on his side. So when he finally does make one single connection, Doc does nothing but torture him with it and threaten Deborah. Then he learns about Joe and holds that against him too. This scene of Doc threatening Baby by knowing about Joe is really ominous, but the best part is at the very end. Doc pressed the elevator button to send Baby up to his floor, and he says, looks like you're going up. Then the elevator chimes and opens, yet Baby takes the stairs. This little, minute act of rebellion is such a weirdly important moment in this movie to me. It's him finally rejecting this life. We see it yet again when he tosses away his phone that he's supposed to keep on him so Doc can reach him, and he ditches his driving gloves, too. He's already decided that this is over. Gonna be honest, Doc isn't very interesting to me at the end of the day, though. No more than Bats or Buddy, at least. He isn't anything more than intimidating until his last scene when we finally see a shred of humanity within this machine of crime. He sees a bit of himself in Baby and Debbie's romance, says he was in love once too. Not only does he give him the money to get across the border, but he gets himself killed trying to let Baby escape. Brutally. I really don't have much to say about what this change means for Doc's character because he kind of didn't really have much of one. But this moment is what puts Buddy from mini boss to final boss. And while I could keep ranting about this scene, I cannot tiptoe around this any longer. We need to talk about Baby Driver's relationship to sound. Because on the surface, this is just a nice story with a good soundtrack, one that spans from end to end of this whole experience. But the deeper you go and the closer you look, the more you realize just how interconnected this whole movie's narrative of music really goes. I mean, at its core, it's named after a song. And everything from Baby's past to his future is indicative of music. Baby's mom was a singer who gives him something very special, his first iPod. Now he has dozens, and his favorite hobby outside of driving is remixing sound bites into beats. He's always got a tape recorder or two on him, and he uses his analog skills to stay up all night making beat after beat. You could see how this could maybe become a problem when some of the stuff he records for beat samples are confidential conversations with his crew. Not only does he sample people's voices, he repeats words himself like he's the sampler. His foster dad Joe is completely deaf, the accident that took his parents' lives also left him with tinnitus, a constant ringing in the ears that can only be drowned out by constantly wearing headphones and listening to music, and thanks to Buddy, he becomes even more impaired. Music is Baby and Deborah's love language. He's constantly singing, dancing around, playing the air piano and air viola. After their conversation about how many songs have Baby in them, the whole OST is littered with these so-called Baby songs. But it's not just what the movie tells us about music that I find interesting, it's how it shows us that motif through its execution. Every sound in this movie happens on the beat. Every car door, doorbell, head nod, police siren, gunshot, explosion, rev of the car, everything down to the windshield wipers happens along with the tempo of the song in the background. Whenever some real shit is happening or his headphones are out, Baby's tinnitus becomes audible. And sometimes that sound morphs into the squealing of the tires. When the music devolves into chaos, not only does the scene, but so does the entire surrounding sound design. To make you feel calm, sometimes it'll just be music and no other audio, and sometimes to make you feel scared, you'll hear the song, the dialogue, and every noise happening outside the car too. This movie is so unique in the fact that you can listen to the soundtrack, and even though all the music is great all by itself, it's just not the same as watching the movie, which is sort of a long visual playlist basically. I wish more movies would try to have this start to end soundtrack with banger after banger like this. But if you're anyone about Edgar Wright, it can be hard to make that feel right. Remember when I was talking about Bats' old crewmate who bailed because of a hex song? Something that means certain death, like Hotel California? When I heard that, I went, huh, how have I never thought of this before? Does this movie have a hex song? Is that the reason everything went bad? And there totally is! The second they pull up to the big score, Intermission by Blur starts playing. A YouTube commenter aptly referred to this as the modern Hall of the Mountain King, a track that spells doom, one that has a crashing, rapidly increasing explosion of sound at its end, only ramping up and up and up and up. It's literally a piano train wreck. That's what the song is about. It's supposed to make you think of a disaster, a train derailing and horribly crashing. 
and everything that happens after Baby shuffles this song is a nightmare. It immediately starts raining. The bank teller starts walking into work, and Baby recognizes her. She was nice, and he doesn't want anything to happen to her. He tries giving her a sign to run, but she took it to heart and comes back with a cop. The bank's alarm starts ringing, the gang runs back to the car, the cop gets pumped full of lead, Baby can't take it. It crescendos and crescendos and crescendos, and then... it crashes. I'm gonna refrain from showing you one of the coolest shots in the movie. A, because of the copyright claim and or age restriction this video could get, and B, because you should really go watch this movie for yourself after whatever this has become. Has this review bled into video essay territory yet? But just because I won't show you doesn't mean I won't spoil it. Bats' death is just as crazy as he was, and honestly, I've gotta thank him because without his noble sacrifice, we wouldn't have gotten the very best scene in this entire movie. Without a shadow of a doubt, my favorite scene in Baby Driver is Baby Runner. Having this movie's most climactic chase be a foot race was a stroke of pure genius to me. Obviously it feels more down to earth and human being our main character in a much more vulnerable state not in his two-ton metal box, and the whole thing is set behind the most hectic song in the entire soundtrack, Hocus Pocus by Focus. Pretty obviously kind of a peck song, but with just enough energy to get Baby through the race and they seriously could not have picked a better track. This is so insane. It's got yodeling, a flute solo, shredding guitar, and it ends in just as much of an explosion as Intermission did. It blares as we follow Baby away from the cops, through a park, doing some parkour, into the mall, into a store to swap clothes on some Scooby-Doo shit. It's, it's great. And when he finally does manage to get into a car, the cool, calm, and collected Baby is as good as gone. He can't stop crashing the second he gets behind the wheel. This time is totally different. Everything is different. Everything is wrong. It might not give us any answers about superstition, but sometimes questions are just as good. What do you think? Do hex songs exist? Is Hocus Pocus the only reason Baby crashed right into Buddy, inadvertently causing the end of Darling? Is Baby a jinx or a good luck charm? Kind of a weird thing to mention, but for some strange reason, my favorite detail in this entire movie is the song playing on the store's radio being in time with Hocus Pocus. It doesn't mean anything at all. No real significance, I just think it's neat. Little satisfying details like that is what separates the dirt huts from the mega builds. To me, detail is key. And this whole amazing moment is followed up by what is probably the best scene in the movie if I'm being unbiased. Buddy beating Baby to the diner to punish him. Everything in the movie sort of comes to a head here. He knows to come here because of Bats exposing Baby for knowing Deborah. It's so good. Everything about this gives me chills. Debbie's stark breathing, Buddy's calm, terrifying demeanor. The stakes of the movie are at an all-time high. Buddy and Baby both know that their names and faces are out there and that it's basically over, but Buddy decides to spend that time going on his last stand instead of trying to finally escape like our protagonist. A cop shows up at the height of the tension right before Buddy shoots Deborah just to ask for a bathroom key. He doesn't pick up on this tense situation in the slightest. For how much this movie humanizes criminals, it goes out of its way to dehumanize cops, which is kind of based. For instance, during the Hocus Pocus scene, there's multiple times when cops all say the same thing in unison, like they're in an anime or they're all robots or something. Like I've said here before, this movie is full of Edgar Wrightisms, like these little details that you would never catch at first, third, or maybe even tenth viewing, like foreshadowing on the TV, or characters from earlier in the movie ending up on the news, everything down to the color of Baby's shirt. The costume designers really need a raise here. Buddy and Darling only wear blue and pink, they're the classic couple, but that dark masculine blue also shows how downtrodden Buddy is. Bats is red because he's a crazed killer, Doc is in a money green suit, and Baby, well, Baby is morally gray. Which is why he starts the movie in black and white. When he's at his most morally dubious, he's seen in a gray shirt. And after he lets everything go and is freed at the end of the movie, his shirt is a glowing white. If it somehow wasn't already clear, this movie is dedicated to its details, and it makes the film end up feeling really tight and interconnected. But no movie is flawless, at least not that I know of. So where does Baby Driver go wrong? I'll start with my real complaints, then it will devolve into nitpicking and hearsay. First and foremost, I really don't get why Deborah does what she does for Baby. 
especially after seeing him shoot somebody and steal an innocent person's vehicle. Also, what's with him being a prick and stealing the guy's phone too? What makes this any different from the woman's purse or the woman and her baby? Luckily, baby got out after five years in prison due to good behavior and parole, but that's also because the people that were nice to him were the ones there in court. Where was this guy? If he was called to the stand, he'd be like, yeah, that Miles guy stole my car and my phone. Baby could have easily listened to the radio like he did in the old lady's car. If she had a phone, would he have stolen it from her too? Debbie doesn't see the events of the movie and therefore has no context to why it's, I guess, okay for Baby to do everything he does, but she goes along with the ride anyway, and that whole time he's blatantly risking her safety, like when he uses her as bait for Buddy. This could have totally turned out horrible, they got lucky, but she's swooning over him like he didn't just tell her to get out and bait the bloody maniac in the stolen cop car. Despite lying and even killing, going back on all his principles, he still gets the good ending. He did pay a price, but was it high enough? Also, why the hell was Debbie not put in prison as well for aiding and abetting a criminal? She literally had damn near just as much to do with Buddy's death as Baby, and was his getaway driver up until they got caught, which is clear as day on the security footage of them ramming a cop car five stories into a fiery explosion. You could probably charge these two with terrorism at this point. But Baby gets time out in the clink and Debbie gets a slap on the wrist, if that. Although I suppose you can see on the cameras that this is mostly self-defense, I suppose. And I guess you could make the argument that she either did face charges and we just didn't see, or she pretended to be a hostage who had no say in the matter, but that theory falls through when she admits under oath that she's madly in love with him and that's why she helped. <sighs> I don't know. For such a thought out experience, I guess I just thought this would have an easier job sticking the landing. The fact that Debbie waits for Baby at all, for five years, a criminal that she met and spent less than six hours with total, it just pushes my believability a tad too far. Because for a movie that's basically chock full of cliches, this movie mostly feels pretty real. You know, once you forget that you're basically just watching a feature length GTA mission. I mean, come on, a Lester chalkboard, the three guys with jumpsuits and crazy masks. A brief oversight about this funny scene that kind of gets under my skin is this little detail that I feel was forgotten in the process of making it. In the high setup, Doc tells the crew that they need to get Michael Myers Halloween masks from the store, and they all need to go separately on different days to avoid suspicion. But Edgar Wright really wanted to make a joke about Mike Myers, so he had one character get three of those masks even though that goes against Doc's plan. There's no dialogue about them being too lazy and making JD go get them or something, and it would have been just as funny if only this dumbass had an Austin Powers mask. So there's no reason for that little plot hole to exist, other than a line that was cut or they just forgot. Either way, I didn't. Something else I didn't forget was Darling getting shot during the pickup. Oh, 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 oh. My wife shot. I don't like that. This bullet in her arm disappears. It never gets mentioned again. She doesn't get medical help. In fact, 10 minutes later, she's acting perfectly fine and has no blood on her. They gotta stay overnight at the factory with Doc, so there's no way she got it treated. So why did it happen? Just to stir up Bass and Buddy a little? It's almost like all these characters except Baby just feel like devices and nothing else. Sounds a lot like another movie I know. Scott Pilgrim and Baby Driver have a few of the same faults. Characters existing to be nothing but basically crash test dummies put in place to give our MC a hard time. The difference is, Scott Pilgrim has better characters simply by the story not being rights. Brian Lee O'Malley's characters are represented mostly pretty well, and they're so charming that they're instantly more memorable than pretty much every character in Baby Driver put together. I wish I could have gone into more detail during my video on Scott. For a much more well-rounded review of the movie, I'd recommend Scott Pilgrim Why the Hate and Why It's Great by Yurik Saladbar. That, in conjunction with my review of the movie, has had me thinking all year about the totality of Edgar Wright's filmography. At first, I wanted to make a bit of a Edgar Wright retrospective, but after I thought about how long that would take, I kind of petered out of the whole idea. Plus, Yurik Saladbar snuck in again to make that video too, and way better than I ever could. Man, what the hell is this guy? I'll leave both of those down in the description below, but before I give all my viewers away, stay with me for a moment. Sometimes it feels like Scott's movie is zany and crazy just for the sake of an energetic experience. I mean, the books definitely had quite a bit of chill downtime that got lost in translation, for obvious reasons. It definitely feels like an adaptation because of that, so in this aspect, I think Baby Driver might be the more complete movie with a more satisfying ending. One of the only things they really have in common is both of them getting the good ending, no matter whether they deserve it or not. Baby Driver feels really reserved in a way that Scott Pilgrim isn't, but SP obviously isn't going for reserved. They're both masterfully crafted films. I find Baby to be a much more interesting main character, but Scott is definitely a more entertaining one. Both of these movies are about equally entrancing to me, but Scott Pilgrim does have this X factor that is so unreplicatable. I knew these would be hard to compare. So all this just leaves the question, is Baby Driver better than Scott Pilgrim? I, subjectively, would have to say yes. 
Despite how much moral ambiguity surrounds Baby Driver, the movie reinforces to us over and over again that Baby really is a good person. A good person who may have done some bad things, but most of the time had no choice. Whereas Scott Pilgrim is about a bad person. A person who hurts the people around him not out of hesitant necessity, but through cheating and general stupidity. Scott Pilgrim might be a more fun watch, but it's not the more satisfying or gratifying film. While Scott's effects are wonderfully fun to watch, Baby Driver's dedication to doing everything practically made every motion of the film more impactful. Sometimes in movies, especially action, it's a little hard to believe whatever's happening is actually happening. Even in Wright's other movies, that's true. I've seen Scott Pilgrim a hundred times, and every time he starts fighting, I'm like, Michael Cera cannot do that, come on. There's a dissonance between the casting and the characters in that situation, but this movie doesn't have that problem, because over and over and over again, it proves to us that this dude can drive. Drive. Hmm. The more I've thought about it, the more I think I should have been comparing this movie to Drive and not one of Edgar Wright's works at all. A much more gritty, realistic portrayal of the getaway driver in a chaotic world of organized crime. Currently, Drive is number 4 on the Jala Review ranking, and Scott Pilgrim is number 8. This list is very fluid and can change over time, so feel free to argue some of my placements. Persuade me. But with that out of the way, where does Baby Driver fall on this list? I've gotta say, above Scott Pilgrim, but below Drive. Drive is like basically what would happen if this movie was realistic. Both movies are great, but Drive definitely wins. It's more dramatic, more tense, there's even better acting. It doesn't have a better soundtrack, but it's shockingly close. Baby Driver is an extraordinarily fun watch to me, and earns the number 7 spot on the Jallo decks or the Jalometer, or whatever you want to call it. Keep in mind that this means nothing, it's just vaguely how much I like them. But that changes day to day. Sometimes, most times for me at least, The Nice Guys is, yes, somehow more enjoyable than Blade Runner. It's shorter, and a little bit more fun. I'll say it again, this basically means nothing, but as a curator, it's just my job to rank and organize. Okay, if you want some opinions that aren't from a biased little bug, then I'll do you one for. Let's take to the streets, let's head on down to the prestigious movie distribution webzone F Movies and see what the general public has to say. Robert Smith says, It was just okay, but the storyline didn't make sense. Baby was fucking stupid. He deserved everything he got. Is all he had to do was finish the job, then pick up Deborah and the money and head to Mexico. But no, he had to try to leave right before the heist. Fucking ignorant. Even if the lady from the bank seen him, it wouldn't have mattered he would be in Mexico. He's, he's kind of right. Legendary news anchor Ron Burgundy writes, I would honestly say skip it. Yeah, there are a few cool things, but the characters are lame as shit. Spacey was alright, Fox was mediocre, and John Hamm was okay. Overall, it wasn't worth the time. I kind of agree, Ron. Other than saying to skip it, this movie is a good watch even if it did fumble the ending. Let's take one more user submitted review. Ogle writes, when the car goes fast, my diaper fills to the brim. You cannot believe! Thanks, guys. And on that note, I think I need to leave. Before I go, this video was brought to you by my patrons like Gambit935, Who's McCann, and Joe Wheelgar. What movie should I review next? What videos do you want to see me doing in general? Ask some questions of your own, because like always, you should stay curious.